we're very excited to have uh, Professor Yael um, with us here. Uh, uh, we tried to get her to speak at the 2017 forecasting workshop. I don't know if you remember this email. Um, so uh, we're very glad that we fi finally were able to um, get her to speak here instead. Uh, so Yael is a professor of business administration at the University of Virginia's uh, Darden School of Business. Her research focuses on data science, forecasting, project management, and behavioral decision making. Uh, she was named one of 21 thought leader professors in data science uh, and is also an award winning teacher. Uh, so welcome. Uh, oh, and the title of the talk um, is a heuristic for combining correlated experts. So welcome, Yael. Thank you so much, Bo, um, that everybody sees me. I think you can see my screen okay. I think you can see um, everything that I have. And uh, Bo, you're gonna give me a five minute warning. So we have time sure. for questions. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I have you on gallery mode so I can see everybody's faces because I need some reaction. And um, I see so many friends and colleagues and known um, I want to say faces, but names in the attendees. So thank you for joining uh, today. Thank you for joining back after the break, which is double uh, reward because I, I, I thought we would lose a lot of folks in the break. Um, and um, I also have a fam friendly face among the panelists. Um, Dave, uh, the lead author on this paper and my, my co-author is here uh, as well. Um, this work has, hey Dave, um, and so it's, I'm so glad that he could join me today. We weren't sure for a while, but it, it's great that he can be here. This work has been really um, his baby for many, for, for a while now, I won't say how long, but it's gone through evolutions. It's a simple idea. It's a simple kind of cool idea that uh, has taken us a while to evolve. And I hope that you'll uh, feel the same after my talk, that it's a, a cool, a simple idea that actually could work really well in practice. And um, this is, uh, I guess, a derivative, I would say, Dave, of your dissertation. Um, and uh, we're in uh, final stages of a revision for a resubmission uh, um, to the journal. So it's a great time for us. Uh, when I was invited, and thank you for inviting me, I'm really excited. Not only it's so heartwarming to see the community of uh, like-minded folks here to discuss this amazing research, and the talks today have been enlightening, but um, it's also, um, so not only was I honored to be invited, I'm also glad because it's a perfect opportunity for us as we kind of fine tune some of the details and it always gives an extra push. So this is work in progress uh, in various phases of uh, uh, resubmission. So it's timely for us to get feedback from you. So I'm hoping that we walk away uh, knowledgeable and more, um, you know, secretly kind of taking advantage of this amazing conference to, to, to improve our paper. Um, there's a working paper out there if you're interested, if you have thoughts or comments, feel free to reach out to myself or to Dave or to Jason Merrick, our third co-author who isn't here today. He is giving a talk in parallel um, in a different conference. Uh, we're all from Virginia, various parts of Virginia. I'm from Charlottesville and uh, Dave and Jason are both in Richmond. Um, but uh, we would love feedback. So if you have any comments, uh, we would love that extra interaction. Um, so just a little bit of a kind of framing, where does this talk fall? It is very much um, uh, related to a lot of the aggregation theme that I've seen uh, being presented today. Uh, um, Villa, you didn't talk too much today about the aggregation part. I know that there's a second uh, paper follow-up to, to the work that you and Barbara presented earlier. Um, and I know that there's plenty more over the next few days um, that look at aggregation. And there's so many folks here that have done work in this field. So um, we're in the aggregation mode, okay? So we're thinking about combining expert opinions. And in this case, we're focusing on expert opinions that um, are given to us in the form of point estimates, okay? So we're talking about continuous variables, most often point estimates. That's our mindset. You'll see the examples of the empirical data sets that we play around with. Uh, they may very much follow in that uh, domain. Um, but it's important to keep that in mind because a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is on the quality of the point estimate that we can derive from aggregating forecasts, very much building on um, work that one of my other colleagues and, 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 and a name uh, worthy of inspiration that I've been honored to work with, Bob Winkler has worked on for many, many years. Um, we're gonna build a lot on those theoretical uh, um, foundations and propose some kind of heuristic compromise uh, to address certain shortcomings or certain uh, puzzle, puzzling effects that have been noted in the literature. So um, 
very generally speaking and pretty uh, unsurprising and not groundbreaking is our basic model where we have a uh, k number of experts trying to predict some quantity of interest um, we're going to assume that we have some history of information on their past submissions and errors um, but we're going to also explore you know, a little bit theoretically, what if we didn't need the historical uh, information? What if we didn't do any estimation? And then we're going to go back and use the historical information to do, do some estimation about the, the properties of these forecasters. We consider the forecasters to have a certain degree of skill denoted by the um, standard deviation of their error. Um, and we're going to, by and large, we're going to assume that that skill can vary. Some folks could be as we know, super forecasters, they could have a high degree of skill and some might um, not have as much skill or be less skillful at the task at hand. Uh, they may be plenty skillful in other tasks, but they may not be as skillful in the predictions that we're asking them to make. So we're gonna have some kind of uh, heterogeneous crowd in terms of their skill set. We're also gonna have experts that are most often positively, but not necessarily, correlated with each other. So the fact that they're correlated with each other is going to be fundamental to our analysis because, as you'll see, the literature has found that simple aggregation rules sometimes, in, or in theory, they really start to hit some boundaries when there is an underlying correlation among the experts. And therefore, when I just aggregate them with a simple average, I am actually double counting information or not accounting for skill enough. So we're gonna have to take into account this correlation that it may exist among them. Um, and we'll show you some empirical data related to whether or not it's positive. In many settings that we study, we find positive correlation between our experts. Um, and really our challenge is we're trying to predict a quantity, you know, uh, uh, for the next period, we get all these opinions. How do we aggregate them? How do we combine them? What kind of aggregation are we gonna do? Uh, typical settings that we're familiar with, this is true for uh, economic data. This is true for um, some sports settings that we've been working on to apply uh, this framework. Uh, this has been true to many, many domains that I'm sure you guys can list within seconds. So what do we know? Well, there are three methods that are well known that have been studied that um, folks are typically debating between. We can have the simple average in which we basically assign same weight, equal weight to everyone. Um, and if, we're assume, if we assign the same weight, Basically, we're making the assumption that they're typically similar in skill set. We're ignoring any um, heterogeneity between them and that there's no correlation among them. We can take it to the next step or many uh, great minds before me have taken it to the next step. And we can um, actually assume that they vary in their skill and we can uh, calculate what we call a variance weight that takes into account that relative skill. That seems like an improvement to enrich the set of circumstances in which we find ourselves. Then finally, if we do think that they're correlated in some way, shape, or form, we can take it to the next level, and this is where Bob, Bob's work builds on others, we can actually come up with optimal weights that take into account any kind of correlation that may exist. So these, what we're going to call for the rest of the talks, these, these are the covariant weights. And we will note and acknowledge that those are the theoretical optimum when we have a setting in which uh, we have correlation among our experts and varying degrees of skills. And so with that in mind, we have these tools. We know that um, we have these capabilities. Why do we need another method or why don't the methods work? Well, I'll talk to you in a moment. I'll share with you in a moment um, how the covariance weights hit some kind of limitation, especially when we're trying to apply this in practice, when we're trying to estimate some of these parameters when we don't know them, when we're trying to estimate them from data. And so we'll see that there is a, a trade-off here, uh, again, a trade-off that many of us have explored in other settings, in which having the optimal weight might be great in theory, but in practice, it just doesn't work that way. Um, what else did I want to make sure that I noted? Um, a few things that are important is that um, first, Winkler and Bob in his paper in 81, he did specify a situation where all the correlations are the same. If we have face a situation where we have a, basically a homogeneous set of correlations, so if all of these correlations here are actually, whoops, 
row, some kind of same row for all of them, then we can actually come up with a pretty uh, nice closed form solution for those weights, which we will use in our analysis as well. So we have that specific case uh, in Bob's development. And another thing that I wanted to note to keep in our back of our mind as I progress through the talk is that covariance weights, typically the effect of using those weights and using a correlation in our calculations is that high skills uh, experts get more weight, low, um, low skills get less weight. And as the correlation gets higher, that becomes more extreme. Okay, so those, it, there becomes an extremity between the weight uh, with some experts getting very, very little weight and some experts getting a lot more weight. Okay, so a little bit about the problem that motivates our solution. Um, as I said, in order to calculate some of these weights, uh, especially the covariance weights, which are theoretically optimal, we need a lot of history. We need data. We need data to come up with the estimates because we don't necessarily know in reality what the sigmas I or what the uh, rho ijs are, are, so we need information. When we estimate based on data, we get some estimation error. So we are not accurate in our, um, in our estimate if we have, especially if we have a little data, which we find ourselves often in that situation. And so if we have a limited amount of data, we will quickly hit a situation where the estimation error is so high that actually in practice, people find that simple methods do much better. Simple average really works like a charm. Folks like to think about the variance as a compromise, which is why we kind of slotted it in the middle. And so it's been a big debate among the authors on this slide and many in this audience, where do you want to, how do you trade this off? Where do you want to find yourself? How do you want to play this game between trying to use the theoretical optimal um, weights versus using the simple average, which is intuitive and so robust and works in practice? So here's our solution. Not that groundbreaking, but really cool. So our solution is to really slot, find a compromise, come up with a compromise, come up with something that finds that balance between estimating something richer than just the variance weights, but not going so far that we have to do so much estimation that we, uh, we struggle with too much error that comes from the estimation. And so our solution is to offer what we call the common correlation. This is our heuristic. The common correlation heuristic is going to say, instead of trying to calculate every one of the rho ij's in the most exact way or estimate it from data, we will propose certain ways to come up with a single, <laughs> a single correlation to rule them all, a single correlation to basically use in our formula, to use in that weight calculation in, and, and try to reduce some of the error through, through this um, common correlation. And so we really view it as a compromise between these different worlds and a, kind of a, a heuristic that slots in the middle. It's not quite as um, you know, theoretically optimal like the covariance weight, but it's not as crude perhaps as the variance weights. And so we slot it in the middle and we follow the same weight structure as, uh, as Bob uh, proposes in his paper, but we are gonna focus a lot of our attention and you will see the results that I'm about to show you. We focus a lot of our attention on how do we calculate that row? How do we calculate this parameter? Oh, now I need to change my colors to make sure that you guys can see it. How do we come up with the best way to calculate this parameter, row C, because now we're replacing all of the row ijs with that row C in our, in our weight calculation. So we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about that. So the first question is, OK, can it do a good job? Can it serve as this compromise tool that we want? OK, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this row C, this kind of um, you know, theoretical common correlation. So C stands for cor common correlation. So we're gonna look at this common correlation. We're gonna study it from a theoretical perspective. If we knew the underlying information, if we knew the properties of the experts, if we knew their skill, if we actually knew the truth about the row IJs, how, what is the best row C that we can find? So we're gonna do that. We're gonna show you that it can actually get really close to the covariance weights um, performance when we talk about, and we're gonna talk a lot about the variance of the combined forecast to prove that. And then we're gonna remove the necessity to know the truth or to know the actual parameter values. And we're gonna give, provide a Bayesian estimate to estimate in practice from data, okay? And we're gonna show you what that looks like. And then 
offer some empirical results depending on time. I'm hope I, I think I'm doing pretty okay on time. So we're gonna offer some theoretical results to show you how this replacement of the covariance calculations, the covariance weights with our common correlation weights, how well does that perform in practice? We're gonna use a couple of data sets. We're gonna do some simulation and so forth to demonstrate its promise. So that's where we're going. Um, and first we're gonna look at, okay, why are we interested in, or how are we gonna know that our row C is a good one? Or how are we gonna know that the row C, the common correlation is a good candidate? Well, when we combine our expert opinions, when we combine all of the point forecasts, we wanna make sure that that combined forecast has the lowest variance possible. We wanna reduce the variance because that would mean that we're gonna get less error. We know that in theory, the covariance weights give us that lowest variance possible for the combined forecast. So the question is, can we get close to that? Can we get with our theoretical uh, common correlation close to the variance that is offered by the covariance weights? So let me make sure that I state that clearly because there's a lot of moving parts. We're gonna look at the variance of the combined forecasts. The combined forecasts use weights. Those weights either use the theoretical covariance weights a covariance uh, matrix in all of the detail, or they use our common correlation. And we're gonna prove to you that we can get pretty close. And so consider the following two uh, images. The image on the left actually shows us a situation, and these are uh, just examples in the paper. It shows us a situation where this red line, our red line, which denotes here our common correlation, okay? This is as we vary the values of the common correlation from zero to, to one, as we vary our common correlation um, value, what happens to the variance in our combined forecast? Common correlation feeds into the weights. What happens to the variance of that combined forecast? Well, in this example, we can see that it can, it starts, it starts when there's, when we assume no zero common correlation, okay, when we, when we're at the beginning, when we assume zero common correlation, it starts exactly where the variance weights are, which makes total sense because it basically converges to that starting point. And it goes down, meaning it decreases, meaning there's a chance for us to find improvement over the variance weights. And in fact, we can get as close and actually hit the level of variance that we find with the covariance weights. So that's great, that's hopeful. And we'll show uh, a, a brief result that shows the conditions. A word of warning, first, as we get higher and higher with our common correlation, you can see here that actually it shots up. It, it really starts to miss and have higher variance. So we wanna avoid those high levels of common correlation. And also another word of warning is this image here on, um, I'm just gonna move, I have to move my zoom uh, instrument here. Okay, so on the image on the right, we can see a situation where actually the common correlation it, does, it doesn't do very well at all. In this circumstance, which we can demonstrate and we can uh, find less common, we would argue, and I'll show you in a moment why, there are circumstances where the common correlation does, does not do us any favors and does not help us uh, reduce that variance of the combined forecast. So we need to really differentiate and find those opportunities for when the common correlation delivers on the promise that we were hoping that it would um, provide. And so our first result, and I'll go through these fairly quickly, um, mostly because um, I don't wanna overwhelm everybody with the, with the notation, but also everybody can read this in the paper. Um, um, our first result basically shows where that improvement will exist, meaning what are the conditions under which we will find that uh, shape that I showed you on the left, when we will find some improvement from using our common correlation when we compare it, for instance, to, the, to using variance weights. And it turns out that this condition is not hard to satisfy. It also, uh, it turns out that this condition is closely related to situations where we have a high degree of dispersion between our, our experts, uh, expert, uh, our experts skills. So if they're very, if I have very skilled experts and not that, that many uh, skilled experts and they're dispersed, those will be situations where I can satisfy this condition. So it's good to know, and it's good to narrow down when we might get some benefit bang for our buck, I should say, when we might gain some advantages from using uh, the common correlation. And a second result says, okay, given that I know that it exists, what is that best common correlation in theory, in theory, assuming I know the number of experts, which I always will know, assuming I know their, um, 
their skill or the standard deviation or variance, assuming that I know the correlation between their errors, what is the theoretical best row C that I can find? What is the best common correlation that I can find? And we can, uh, and that is our, our second result in which we show the form of that. It looks messy, but it's actually um, quite intuitive in how it behaves. And it's not hard to prove that very often it will actually uh, satisfy the optimality conditions that we provide. And so there is, in theory, a minimum common, uh, sorry, there is, in theory, a common correlation that minimizes the variance of our combined um, forecast, as you saw in that chart. So this is just basically characterizing that point in which the variance is minimized. Now we're gonna hit some limitations, meaning all this is good and well in theory. In practice, we don't often, or most often, we don't actually know the underlying true properties of our forecasters, so we need to come up with a Bayesian estimator. So in the circumstances, rho ij and sigma i um, squared, so the skill are not known, um, and therefore we need to make some assumptions. So we're gonna now use that historical data that we have. We knew that we had a history of these forecasters and their behavior. Now we're gonna start making it uh, meaningful and useful to us. And so now we're gonna make certain assumptions um, and they're pretty standard assumptions. We're gonna assume that the um, skills are independent of the uh, correlations. We're gonna assume that our history has certain properties such as uh, multivariate normal distributions. We're gonna assume that we um, know something that we estimate uh, our standard deviations. So we make a, a certain set of assumptions and we make an assumption about the prior distribution of uh, of part of our structure in order to be able to, what our, my co-authors like to say, use the Bayesian crank and apply it to come up with the posterior distribution of this covariance matrix in a situation that allows us ultimately, and this is our goal, to come up with a predictive distribution for the next quantity of interest. For the next quantity of interest, from there we get our Bayesian um, estimator. And so we show in our third result, and really the main result in the paper, is that the Bayesian maximum uh, posterior estimator for basically our next quantity of interest, or the quantity of interest in the period that we care about, is a linear combination between uh, the expert forecasts and, um, or some kind of theoretical prior, and some kind of average assessed from the different correlations that come from my experts. Not hard to, to use in practice, well, actually demonstrate it, how easy it is to apply this in, in practice, but it's a really good kind of tool to walk into the setting. We will also show, as I'm about to with the empirics, that this Bayesian estimator is not the only way you can go about calculating your common correlation. It's just nice to have it in the back pocket and it turns out that it performs pretty well, um, but it's not necessarily gonna be the only uh, common correlation approach that you can utilize. Okay, what we do with it, before I'm gonna show you some empirical results to prove that it can perform pretty well, we also uh, run some numerical uh, simulations in this context where we're relying on historical data and on sample information to estimate the parameters of the model. And it allows us to really uh, highlight what I mentioned at the beginning is part of the problem with, um, with, my, covariance, with my covariance weights. What is part of my problem with the covariance weights? Well, you can see it here in this chart. Let me quickly orient you. I'm gonna start with the one on the left. Basically the height and totality of each one of these bars is the variance, the same variance of my combined forecast that I've been looking at all along. There is some part of the variance that is basically irreducible across the different estimates. It is uh, the error that is basically exists in my estimate. However, it, the rest of it is basically divided into two. Part of it is coming from estimation error and part of it, or noise, part of it is coming from bias because we're not actually fitting the optimal, uh, uh, the optimal weights to combine the forecasters. And so we really can see here that the simple average that uh, ignores any, you know, any kind of skill differential or it ignores any correlation, it suffers from a high degree of bias but we can see that the covariance weights really suffers from a high degree of uh, estimation error, which ultimately results in inferior performance. 
And as important, it points out to us the benefits, this CCR is our common correlation. It shows us the benefits of our common correlation. Yes, we still have some bias. Yes, we still have estimation error, but we're kind of slotting ourselves in between to benefit from both worlds. I'm gonna speed up so I can show you some empirics because I hope that that will um, kind of bring it to life a little bit. What we do is we use two data sets. We use some data from uh, macroeconomic forecasts. Uh, this is thanks to a partnership with Focus Economics who provided us some data, um, 68 quarterly uh, predictions and realizations uh, for um, 15 countries in totality and for seven economic quantities. So lots and lots of data that we, we have forecasts and we have uh, one quarter ahead re uh, realizations. We also have data from experimental forecasts, and that was uh, courtesy of uh, Jack, Rick, and um, Al Manis that provided us with the data that they basically aggregated from many, many, many experimental settings where folks were asked questions like, what year did um, a certain individual win a Nobel Prize, or how much wealth does a certain individual have? Um, and so individuals had to answer in lab circumstances those types of questions, and we have all of that data. Um, these data sets differ in some ways, and one thing to note here real quickly is that um, the experimental data set has slightly higher variability in skill, so that's going to play a role in terms of our results. And what we did is to demonstrate the capabilities, we looked at training or fitting our um, estimates uh, based on different size, different sizes of training sets. So we have either four, eight, 12, or 16 uh, data points on which to fit our data. So not huge amounts of data, definitely not in today's world of big data, but varying histories on, uh, with which we're, we're working with to demonstrate the capabilities. And I'll breeze through these very quickly so I can pause and ask some questions. First, we looked at how did our common correlation uh, Bayesian estimator compare to other ways to come up with a common correlation. And we have a few suggestions here. You can come up with a common correlation using just an empirical, um, just an average of what you find empirically of all the correlations. You can use our Bayesian estimator. You can exogenously search a grid um, between zero and one, just fine on a training set what works uh, best. Um, or you can use all of the data set to try and get as close to your kind of theoretical um, uh, formula that we actually offered in our second result and see how well that performs in practice, given that we know that there's going to be estimation error. So when we do that, um, a couple of words on how we're going to compare and I'll kind of I'll just focus your attention on, on what to take away from all the numbers I'm about to show. We look at two, um, two, two ways to think about the results. One way is to look at how often does the result uh, improve compared to the simple average. And we're going to look at MAPE here because our quantities are on various scales. So we're going to look at mean uh, absolute percentage error. And so we're going to look at the percent of time it's better than simple average. And we're going to look at the average MAPE improvement. So how much better does it do uh, overall? And what we're going to quickly show here, and again, lots of numbers, plenty of opportunity to read in the paper, basically highlight that the Bayesian estimator performs quite well. All of our estimates, actually all of these estimate, estimators do better than the simple average. You can see based on the percentages um, with the Bayesian estimator performing the best. Next, um, so, this, uh, so this chart, before I move on to the next comparison, this chart just looks at um, the common correlation estimate, the ROC itself. And basically this provides a little bit of the intuition why the Bayes estimate does so well. It performs like a shrinkage uh, tool. It allows us to really uh, rein it in and not get extreme values. And because of that, we're actually doing really, really well. Whereas the other tools are a little bit more volatile in terms of, and high values for that uh, row C, which we know high values are not necessarily good. We perform a couple of other comparisons. One comparison that we perform is with other, with the covariance weights, with the variance weights, and with winds arising. Here we see that winds arising actually performs uh, quite well uh, very often, although our common correlation is still doing great. Um, obviously, it's the same results from before. Um, but when you look at the average MAPE improvement, our common correlation shines. So it's still delivering the most bang for your buck if you look at average MAPE. And then finally, um, 
uh, we compare the weights, how well their weights are. And again, to provide more intuition, why does our common correlation do so well? Well, our common correlation, if we look at the weighting, we are you know, covariance weights are all over the place, very extreme as we predicted. And here we have a case where our weights are a little bit more um, tamed and actually uh, uh, there's still variability there, but not as much. And then finally, we compare to many other uh, techniques out there in the literature. Uh, David Badesco and Eva Chen have their paper from 2015, which many of us um, are familiar with. And other great papers here uh, quoted, um, gives us a rich set of methods to compare to. And again, when we compare, we can see that the common correlation performs well or, or pretty impressive com uh, on, on average MAPE. And I'll end with this kind of pitch for it. One of the interesting observations here is that using the common correlation method, if I'm using it to, to include or to put weights on various experts, some of the other methods leave experts out of my pool. So maybe you just look at your super forecasters. That's the type top five method. It was sometimes if you're trimming, you're leaving experts out. If we live in a world of inclusion, we wanna kind of keep as many experts as we can and all experts, so these, this bar um, chart or this box plot shows you that when I work with all experts, I have a wide range of number of experts included and my common correlation comes in second in terms of the number of experts. Um, if I look at like keeping as many as possible, whereas some of the other methods, you just are, end up dropping too many experts, which ultimately has some implications for their participation in the future. I will stop there. It was a marathon. I said a lot. I hope I didn't go too much over time. I hope folks uh, took something away from it. It's a simple idea, but look how much I can talk about it. It's a real uh, a cool heuristic that tries to find a compromise between using theoretical optimal weights and uh, more simple and robust methods. And uh, we believe it has a lot of um, uh, properties that are appealing to folks in practice. So thank you very much. Um, good. So we already have a question and we have a couple minutes for more. So please do add more questions. Um, so the question is, what if you're using two parameters uh, instead of one? So for example, you could break, this is from Grant, um, you could break agents into two groups and you could have sort of an intergroup co common correlation and an intragroup. Um, so in general, you know, what about generalizing this and making it more and more complex? You see, it was worth coming to this conference already. I think that's a great idea. Um, we're always going to find a, there's always going to be a balance between um, adding richness to the model versus then finding yourself quickly slipping down the route of finding all the you know pairwise correlations, which we know is going to lead to too much um, estimation error. But I think that's a great idea. I can see. For example, we can use maybe some clustering techniques to kind of come up with those groups to try and find the you know two very common clusters and, and find them separated from each other. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, along those lines, I was going to ask about sort of heterogeneous um, experts and you know what are you what are you sort of worried about in terms of settings where it might be a problem. So from, from my experience trying, so we've been trying to apply this. So we, you know, this is our go-to now, like, uh, you know, tool in our toolkit when we work with uh, practitioners. And uh, what we found in a certain setting that we've been exploring it is that we, we've worked with a setting where the experts were so, so highly correlated, like they were on the extreme, really highly correlated experts that, I mean, obviously we all know wisdom of the crowd already suggests that we're gonna run into problems and in diminishing return from aggregating them. But it also means that we have to shrink it so much or we have to pull it away so much that it starts, you know, it, we start struggling with applying it in a useful way because they're, they're just so highly correlated. So those are some interesting settings where we need to still pay attention to. Obviously, you know, it's always the desire to not have them uh, highly correlated, but, um, you know, that's something to think about. Yeah, and Villa asks a great question. Um, we do assume unbiased experts in our model, okay. Um, I'm just reading your question. Hey, Villa, you can actually unmute yourself. So you have, you're in a position of power. Um. No, I just wanted to ask you about, um, because I noticed in the model that you assume that they're basically centered at the correct data, right? They're unbiased experts. Correct. So. 
Um, I mean, this is not really a problem because you have all this past data, so you can technically just unbias all Correct. the forecasters before you aggregate them. Is this something that you do or did you try? Does that actually improve anything? Or Yes, we do do it and it, it helps us, um, but it still doesn't resolve uh, all of the problem. Yeah. Um, we have a uh, follow up from Grant um, for the Bayesian estimator. Um, so do you need a prior on the parameter? You I'm do. guessing you would ask how, how do you get it? Yeah, um, we yeah. do need we do need a prior um, on that's a great question. There is a need for a prior um, and you can get it either from historical data and you can uh, uh, experiment on a we, I mean, what we show in the paper is we used a certain set of parameters that we actually are, are pretty much extreme, meaning they actually give you the highest level of common correlation in terms of the parameters that we chose. Um, and you can use, of course, more sophisticated MCMC methods or whatever you have if you want to, but uh, we made certain assumptions. And of course, you can always find different assumptions based on the training data that you have. It's very different for the different data sets. They behave differently. So uh, we would encourage uh, in practice folks to apply something that makes sense to them. Uh, there are a couple of hyperparameters there that I specified on one of the slides that we had to had to choose, and we did that uh, with some some level of experimentation. Uh, I thought maybe David uh, was going to add. Uh, okay, um, there's more to the question. Um, so on the output of the Bayesian um, estimator, do you get do you get sort of a, a posterior a whole distribution over parameters? Yes. Um, and so. Um, I guess I'm wondering, how do you pick, and Grant asks, um, is this why it does better than grid search, basically? Yes, that's exactly right. It, it, that's exactly right. Um, you can look at the, the mean of that distribution. You can look at the posterior distribution. You can look at the, the, the mode of that, uh, uh, the median of that uh, posterior distribution. We actually experimented with, uh, with all of those, um, and the median does well, um, and, and that was the one that we chose, and that's why it does do better than some of the exogenously determined uh, common correlations. We've tried minimum value. We've tried a lot of different values and uh, it turned and the Bayesian estimator thankfully works well. So. Mm -hmm. 